Hello, I am Wanda Lotus, your friendly neighborhood fine art photographer. <laughs> I just felt like saying that. I am friendly, though, most of the time. We won't get into that. Um, so for those who don't know you, that don't know me, like I said, my name is Wanda Lotus. I live in New York City, and I am a fine art photographer. I primarily do street photography. Um, but I also do some event photography and small wedding photography. And by small weddings, I mean um, usually no more than something like 20 or 30 guests with a very small wedding party, if there's any wedding party at all. That's my niche. I leave the bigger, more formal stuff to um, people who have a passion for that kind of thing. So, um, as you know, throughout 2020, we've been going through this, um, dealing with this pandemic, um, novel coronavirus, or uh, also known as COVID-19. And so that has meant that in a lot of places, we have had to sharply curtail our outside activities. Um, it's a bit of a bummer because it, this happened right around the time winter ended and the weather started getting nice. And that's the time when um, I generally spend a lot more time outside with my camera in gardens or in the street, making photos of the people and just appreciating the scenes of everyday life here in New York City. My passion is uh, everyday people just living their lives. I generally don't do posed portraits. I like unposed, just people doing their thing. Um, and uh, enjoying and just living their own lives. Well, I haven't been able to do much of that because I've been inside social distancing in order to protect myself and my partner from uh, possible uh, transmission of COVID-19. And it's bad enough that my partner is an essential worker. They work for a delivery company, so they uh, their job did not clothes. That's good on the one hand because I work from home full-time. I do have a full-time nine-to-five job um, and it is remote work. I've been doing it for over 10 years now. I'm very, very happy with that arrangement and have no plans to change that anytime soon. Um, but my partner is an essential worker and their job did not close. So it's good in the sense that financially we've been fine. Nothing has changed for us financially. Um, but that does mean that as they come and go uh, for work, even outside of any essential errands, that does put us at risk for possibly contracting COVID-19. Um, but we do what we can. We wear masks. When we go out, we wear masks. We wear gloves. Um, we make sure to wash our hands thoroughly. Um, we uh, disinfect. We were, were able to find disinfectant spray after searching for it for a long time. So now we're able to properly disinfect our door handles and shopping carts and any of those um, uh, frequently touched places. And when I go out with my camera, I do wipe down my camera body with uh, disinfecting spray just because... You know, if I'm out there and I touched something and then I touch my camera and I happen to pick up the virus when I touched that thing, well, then I had then transferred it to my camera. So we do take whatever precautions we can. I have been very anxious about going out. Um, restrictions are starting to be lifted and areas are opening up again. I know in New York State, we started phase one of reopening the state, I think a week ago. And I still haven't, I need to go online and educate myself about what the phases of reopening are. Um, but we still haven't gotten to the point yet where cultural institutions like the New York Botanic Gardens, for instance, are reopened so that I would be able to go there and do some street photography and enjoy nature and do some nature photography. Um, and because I have been anxious about possibly contracting COVID, I haven't been out on the streets walking around 
and making photos. But I do make an effort when I know that I'm going out for an essential errand. If possible, I take my camera with me. And that's what I did today, and that's why I'm streaming today. I went grocery shopping in the late morning, um, and I did take my camera with me and made a few shots, not many. I, I think I ended up with 13 or 14 in total. So I wanted to share that with you. And what I've done is uploaded them from my camera's memory card to my laptop. Um, but I have not yet looked at them. I haven't even imported them into my software. Uh, I use Corel Aftershop Pro and I haven't imported them yet into the software. So what I am going to do, what did I do with my hard drive? I need to plug that in so I can import my photos. Okay, just checking real quick, making sure my mic is working. My mic is still working. I've been having some problems uh, with this mic. Um, the wire in it is probably starting to die. I've had these uh, earbuds for quite some time. They've been all over New York City with me over the past few years, and they are probably on their last legs. So, okay, let me switch now. I'm going to pull up my photo editing software. So for a long time, I used Adobe Lightroom. I loved Adobe Lightroom. I would often tell people if they asked about it that I wanted to marry Adobe Lightroom and have its babies. <laughs> because being someone who loves organization, I love having my own things organized. When I discovered Adobe Lightroom, I naturally was drawn to it because it allowed me to much more easily organize my photos than I had been able to in the past. And I was able to edit my photos in it, put keywords, um, keep them organized in the directory structure, all of that good stuff that uh, anyone who's been doing photography for some time is probably aware of photo editing and organizing software and what you can do with them. Well, Adobe moved to a subscription um, plan where before you could buy the software outright. It was yours as long as you had the uh, serial number, registration key. Uh, even if you got a new computer, you could install it. You could type in your registration key. You could continue losing. You continue using it as long as you had all of that, and as long as your computer was supported by the software, it was yours to use. When they moved to a subscription plan, all of that changed, and so now with a subscription, you have to pay monthly. And uh, for, in order to access the software, um, and if you do not renew your subscription, you lose access to the software. Now, the good thing about the subscription plan is that any updates made to the sub software, you get them automatically as a part of your subscription. The bad thing about that is, say you are someone like me who doesn't change their gear every year, every couple of years. Um, and as long as your gear is continuing to work for you for the things that you use it for, then you're fine with keeping that gear. You don't have to upload, um, you, you don't have to replace your gear so you don't have to upload new uh, camera, uh, new software to support your new camera law depending on what new model you bought. Um, so someone like me, if I got a version of Adobe Lightroom, I would be able to use it for many years without any problem. Well, that's no longer the case. With a monthly subscription, you have to continue to pay. As soon as you stop renewing your subscription, you no longer have access to the software, not even previous versions of the software. I did not like that. So I put my money where my mouth was and I transitioned from using Adobe Lightroom, which I never paid a subscription for. I paid for it outright. I transitioned from using Adobe Lightroom to using Corel Aftershot Pro 3. And so that's what I'm gonna use now. 
I've been using it for uh, about a year and a half now. I, I think it was October of 2018 because as you can see the name of my library is Aftershock Catalog 2018 so I think it was October of 2018 that I started using Aftershock Pro so I've been using it for about a year and a half and I like it of course there was a learning curve um, because the software is new to me, uh, well, was new to me. I, I can use it well now with very few hiccups, but um, it was new to me, so I had to learn how to do all of the stuff that I had done for many years in Lightroom. I had to figure out how to do them, if they were even, um, well, I knew they were possible because I had read the features, but I had to figure out how to do them in Corel Aftershot Pro. Um, but over the past year and a half, everything that I knew how to do in Lightroom, I figured out how to do in Corel Aftershot Pro 3. The only thing that I can't do is while I am uploading, while I'm importing photos into Corel Aftershot Pro 3's library, I cannot also copy them to a backup drive. So that's the only thing. I just have to do that manually. It's, it's an extra step. That's fine. I will do it. So, okay, so these, I'm in file system mode now in Corel Aftershot Pro. And these are the photos that I made today while I was out. I had, I, I shoot with a Canon um, 5D. It's a full frame camera. It's a 5D Mark II. I had an original 5D and one year, a few years ago, on my birthday, I made the mistake of believing that the weather, um, weather resistant ceiling on my camera was the same as my camera being weatherproof. And I took my camera out and even when it started to snow, a very heavy, wet snow, I didn't put it away. And the next day, my camera let me know in no uncertain terms that it was not happy with what I had done the day before. And it refused to start up. And when I took it to the shop, there was just so much water damage that it didn't make any sense to even attempt to repair it. The, the repairs would have cost more than the camera was worth at that time. So I ended up buying a Mark II and I've been shooting with that ever since. I know they're up to the Mark IV now or, or is it the Mark V? Um, but there are a few models up now for the Canon EOS 5D and uh, like I said before, as long as the gear that I have works for what I want to do, then I have no problem with keeping my gear besides I think the camera body brand new is something like $2,500, which ain't happening. So these are the photos I made today. I, I have my 50 millimeter lens on my camera body and it's only, let me see, only 13 images. So um, now I get to import them into my library. And because I am a, an organization, well, I won't say I'm an organizational freak, but because I like to have all of my stuff organized, there is a very specific directory structure that I use for my photos. And it makes it easy for me to find what I need if I go looking for it later. And it's even incorporated a lot of times. Well, this time I, I didn't do it, but usually I even incorporate the uh, subject matter into the file name so that um, even just if I run across a file randomly and um, you know, don't know anything about it. I can get a general idea of what it was about based on the file name and based on the directory that it was in. So let's see, today is June 14th. So I will save it into my June 14th, 2020 
directory. I have seen that some photographers have still been out walking around and um, doing street photos. And a lot of them have been documenting extensively the changes in the world based on COVID-19. And then after the protests against police brutality, against black lives, um, people started protesting that. There have been a lot of photographers who have gone out and covered those things. I generally do not cover protests um, simply because I don't trust the police. And I have heard too many stories from people I know who have been to peaceful protests and had police officers grab them and slam them to the ground with no provocation on their part and, um, you know, beat them up and say, oh, stop resisting, stop resisting, stop resisting arrest and, you know, basically do damage to their person. And I don't want that to happen to me. I, and I don't certainly, I don't want that to happen to my gear, but most of all, I don't want that to happen to me. So my hat's off to people who do put their bodies and their lives on the line like that. I personally am not interested in putting myself on the line like that. So I do not have protest photography, but I do. And this is in everyday life as well. I do like to go out and just find beauty in everyday life, whether it's in regular people outside of the um, very, um, what's the word that I'm looking for? It's for curated, outside of the very tightly curated um, world of the entertainment industry, you know, the celebrity limelight and stuff. I like finding people outside of that, people who live everyday lives and just appreciating the beauty in them and in their lives. And I like to do the same thing with the environment around me. So this tree I was actually the one of the first things I saw when I stepped out of the door this morning and I liked the shapes of the branches, um, the shadows, I liked the coloring variations, the contrast of the mulch underneath it and the brick behind it. So this is going to be a photo that I'm going to revisit. Now I took a few frames of these flowers trying to get just the right view. <laughs> And um, I know the last couple are what I wanted. This one, not so much because I did get the front flower in focus, but because my depth of field wasn't, uh, I think I had it set to 5.6 at this point. So the flowers in the background aren't in focus. And that's usually that's fine. But because most of the frame is taken up with the background and not with the flower in the foreground, then it doesn't really catch my eye in a way that I like. So I'm just going to go by that one. I'm not going to not going to spend any time on it. Now, this is more my style. So we still have the background that's blurred very nicely but then we have more of the frame filled by the um, foreground that's in focus and I think let me check my um, my camera settings because I believe I was still shooting yeah I was sh still using aperture 5.6 but it's just that the way I composed the shot I composed it with more of the um, more of the in focus foreground filling the frame so that's what I'm going to use there let me see did my music go off I think my music went off let me see no it's still on it's just very low 
you hear in the background, that's T practicing tenor sax. We are a musical family. I play violin, steel pan, handbells, and I sing. Um, I haven't played handbells in about a year now because last year I took a break from the handbell choir that I had been bringing in for a number of years so that I could focus on playing violin with a community orchestra. It was my first time playing with a community orchestra and with violin being my first love, <laughs> it has been amazing to be able to focus on that, focus most of my energy on that. So let's see, so I'm gonna keep this one, look at it again later, unless there's another one that, um, that I like even better. Now this one's okay, but again, most of the frame is filled with the out of focus background. So I don't really want to keep that one. This one, I have most of the frame filled with the foreground that I deliberately have in focus. Um, so I'm going to keep that one. But between the two, I like the one with mostly the, uh, are these hydrangeas? No, I think these are azaleas. Uh, no, rhododendrons. Okay, rhododendrons have 10 stamens, I think. These aren't rhododendrons because they don't have 10, sta uh, 10 stamens. Whatever is in that, in that family, this is one of those flowers, but it's not a, a rhododendron. Um, okay, so I'm going to keep that one. Now, I wish that I had captured them um, closer. They passed me while I was photographing the flowers and I was so busy trying to get just the right shot of the flowers that by the time I looked up and realized this was the scene I wanted to photograph, they were pretty far down the sidewalk and with a 50 millimeter lens, I couldn't zoom in to really fill the frame with them, but I might still be able to do something with that. Maybe not for a photograph that I can print, but for something to share online, because I'm shooting with a full frame camera, I have a lot of leeway in terms of what I, you know, getting away with cropping and still being able to get a, uh, a very nice picture out of it. Now between the two of these, I like this one better just because you know the trees are straighter, the sidewalk is centered in the bottom of the frame. So right now I'm just going through and choosing the photos that I want to edit later. Mm. I don't know if I want to Okay, they weren't in focus in that one, so I wouldn't use that one. They aren't really in focus here either. Here I was shooting from the hip. So shooting from the hip is when I have my camera either at my hip or just in front of me at my belly, and I'm just aiming my camera in the general direction of what I want to capture and basically praying that the photo comes out. Uh, in this case, it didn't. It, if... Um, if I had been lucky or if I had had my focus points set more broadly, then I would have ended up with a photo of them um, in focus. I probably needed to be shooting at like F8, F11, and just in general focusing for everything, have focus set to, to infinity, and then that would have gotten them in focus and I would have been able to work with it more, but I'm going to have to bypass them, at least for right now, um, because I don't want to, uh, having them out of focus isn't really speaking to me. When I go out, I've been making a lot of photos of the trees, first because I love trees, I love nature, um, and second because I... That, because I haven't been photographing people, I've almost been forced to really focus on everything else in the environment. And even though this is New York City, trees are a part of the environment here. We have trees growing all over the five boroughs of New York City. And, uh, you know, the crews, the city will come out and... Um, 
help to maintain them, you know, cut down dead branches or remove dead trees. And this is one of the trees that I saw today. I believe I was looking up into this tree. I'm pretty sure this is the same tree I was looking up into. Oh, and that's the last shot. I'm going to grab this one. Even though it's crooked, I can always fix that in post. I can fix that in the software. Okay, so I've gone through my 13 photos. And these are the seven of the 13 that I've decided I actually want to spend time working on. Let's see. Another TTV viewer. Hello, how are you? I hope you're having a good Sunday. Let's see. Let me start with this photo of this tree that I saw almost as soon as I stepped out. I mean, it was, it's literally right at, at the right at the front door of our building. So truly, there was no way to miss it. So let's see, what do I want to do with this? There are a couple things I can do with it. I can make it black and white. Let me just play around with it for a bit. So the first thing that I'm going to do is make a copy of it, make a new version of it. And the second version I'm going to play around with black and white with. The first version, I'm going to, the master, I'm going to play around with in color. Let's just wait for it to create the new version. There we go. And I'm going to go ahead and change this to black and white. And then I'll come back, come back to that one in a minute. So let me start playing around with the color one. I'd like for the colors to be a little bit more vibrant. Let me see. Let me bump up the exposure a bit so it's not so dark. And let's do, see if I can do a little bit of, I can't recover too much in the highlights it looks like because the highlights are so dark, uh, so bright to begin with, but that's okay. It's what's in the foreground that I'm really interested in. Uh, do I want to make, let's make it a little warmer. The temperature a little warmer. Um, bump up the blacks some, and that'll give the photo more depth. You know, when your your blacks are faded, then your photo is not, it, it looks flatter. You know, there's not as much depth to it. Oh, let me, let me do a little bit of sharpening too. I just have minor sharpening. Every photo, no matter what digital camera you use. Every photo needs a little bit, at least a little bit of sharpening. Um, nothing looks good straight out of camera. You don't want to overdo it, but you also don't want to underdo it. So now let me see. Something's missing. Uh, did I make it too warm? I don't know. Let me bump the vibrance up and see. If I bump the vibrance up, it gives makes it a little bit greener than I would like. I really like the detail, how the detail came out. I mean, you can see the, the bark. And this is one of the benefits of shooting with a full frame camera. You really pick up a, a full frame fra camera and a good lens. You really pick up a lot of the detail, even when you're not standing right up on top of something. And that, that's um, particular to full frame, full frame cameras. If I had shot this with my cell phone, it would have looked good zoomed out like this. But if I full, zoomed in so that it was full resolution, you wouldn't have gotten all of this detail, you know, and I, I was standing quite a few feet away, but you wouldn't have gotten all of this detail simply because the sensors in cell phones are very small. 
So it's like the difference between um, being able to paint a photo on a pinhead and being, being able to paint a picture on a pinhead versus being able to paint a picture on a postage stamp versus being able to paint a picture on an eight and a half by 11 canvas. The more space you have, the more space you have to fill in details. The same is true of cameras. And that's why uh, cell phone camera photos will not have the same kind of detail up close uh, when you zoom in. They will not have the same kind of detail as even a crop sensor um, DSLR. I'm, I'm shooting with a full frame full-frame sensor DSLR this it still looks like it's missing something maybe there's too much red let me go into my curves and see what happens let's see do I want to, if I bring it down it makes it greener I don't really want it greener let me fix the curves what I want is the red to be less saturated uh, let's see. Oh, there's the ticket right there. So I'll slide down the saturation slider just for the red. See, because the mulch, the mulch is red. There are red tones in the tree. And then, of course, the brick behind it is also red. So if I slide that down, that gets rid of a little bit of the red. I need to do the same thing for the green, too. Let's slide the... No, that's not... For the green, it's not really doing anything. Now, a lot of this stuff that I do is um, just trial and error. I know what I want. Sometimes, like in this case, I don't exactly know how to get what I want. So I just try different things until I figure out what works. I won't mess with the... Um, I won't mess with the curves anymore. I don't know. Maybe maybe this is what was there. I'm not even sure what I'm looking for. Let me just oops, stretch my leg out a bit. Oh, my other monitor came unplugged. Yes, let me plug that back in. I need that just so that I can keep track of the other windows that I need while I'm streaming. Okay, now let me go back. There we are. We're back now. Okay. Let's see, maybe this is just what it was. See, because I'm not really even sure what I want. I, I think I want, I would like to be, it. I'd like for it to be a little bit more yellow. But changing the temperature to make it warmer isn't helping with that. You know what? Let me go back to the red color correction. Change it back to the way it was. Hmm. So changing the yellow, I don't like how that looks though. It gives it a weird cast. You know what? Let me do an S curve. <laughs> that makes it more contrasty. And I think I already adjusted the contract but I like this I like that tiny bit of extra contrast that I just added let 
and brighten up it, brighten it up just a little more. All right. And turn that down just a little bit. Okay, I'm going to keep this for now and move on to the next one. Now, this is the black and white version of it. This definitely needs to be brighter. I found that when I um, change things to black and white, a lot of times I automatically have to make them brighter. Make it more contrasty, definitely. But then I also I need to bump up the exposure some more. Well, the nice thing with black and white is instead of worrying about things like color cast, it really brings out textures and patterns. And that's what's happening here. So if you look at the two, can I look at them side? Yes, I can. So when you look at them side by side, so here in the color one, you, you see textures and patterns, but you also see the colors and you see the color cast, um, the photo temperature. Here, you're just looking at textures and patterns. So you really want to bring those things out At least I want to. I don't know what other photographers want to do. I, I can't speak for them. I shouldn't. Uh, I can't speak for other photographers, but I want to bring those things out. See, I did the sharpening. It could stand to be even a little bit more contrasty than it is, I think. I don't want it to be too much, but... A slight S curve seems to do the trick. So I'm going to save that one. I wonder if I want to. Oh, there's one more thing I want to try. Let me make, make a new version of the color one. Edit version, new version from Carip. There is an editing style I've been experimenting with, um, usually for my Instagram posts, but sometimes with my street photography as well. Usually I do it with um, my nature photos or, or more personal photos, but let's fix these curves. And let me see, let me go back to full view. Uh, make it nice and contrasty. And I'm going to give it a little bit of an antique type look. And that involves first washing out some of the color. So we're going to bring that up. We're going to bring up the blue. I'm going to bring up the blue usually around halfway and then I'll bring the green up about halfway between the bottom and the blue. You know, and that seems to give it a, it, it's not a sepia tone, but it, it has that same feel as, uh, you know, maybe an, an antique, has that same antique type feel that uh, sepia tends to have. And then let's see. Put a little bit of an S curve in it, like that. Then go back. No, that's too yellow. Back it up just a bit. There. It's, it's a very uh, stylized type. It's a dreamier, dreamier type edit. That's the, the phrase I was looking for. Um, it gives me a feeling of like dreaminess. And I like that. I really do like that. <laughs> I, I actually like it even a little bit better than, than this one. So I'll definitely keep that. Okay, and then there's the black and white version of the same photo. Now let me go to my flowers. This one, because I was shooting in shade, I think I was shooting 
in now uh, auto white balance and auto white balance doesn't always hit the mark it does a decent job yeah you know, I will say that but it doesn't always hit the mark um, in terms of the white balance needed so I'm going to warm that up a bit and I'm going to brighten it up a bit definitely bump up the vibrance because I want the the color in the flowers is subtle um, but I really want to make it pop here and I think I want to crop it because I'm finding these leaves over here to be distracting because they're in focus so let's crop these out so we can just focus on the flowers that's mostly better but I don't like the balance of the background and foreground. I bring this down. Okay, that's better. And sharpen it. It could stand to uh, stand to be a little bit brighter. I'm also watching the histogram up here because I, I don't want to totally blow out either the um, shadows or the highlights. Okay, and now I want to make it a little more contrasty. You know, see how bringing that down really brought out the detail in the petals? Let me do it again so you can see. So I bring this down. It really brings out the detail in the petals and in the leaves. But I don't want to get rid of the light. So I'm going to brighten it up just a tad on the high end. Just a bit there. And because of the vibrance, now you can really see, I mean, especially if you zoom in, of course, but now you can really see those beautiful full blossoms. So I'm going to mark that one for sharing. Now I have these flags up here uh, for color coding. So anything that I color code blue is stuff that I'm most likely going to share on um, my personal Instagram account. Um, and I tend to use a lot of uh, blue, like when I make text in my Instagram stories, most of the time it's blue. It's a habit I got into a couple of years ago and I've just kept it. So I use a blue label for those photos. The purple ones I use for the stuff that I'm going to share on uh, Lotus Land Fine Art, whether it's my website or my um, Patreon or uh, my Instagram, Lotus Land Fine Art. Instagram account and that's because the theme colors that I use for Lotus Land Fine Art are black and purple. Purple is my favorite color and um, you know as my name is Wanda Lotus and I named my company after myself as Lotus Land well I might as well use my favorite color so that's what I do. So let me I just noticed that there is a bit of that blossom on the bottom and because it's in the middle of a green leaf it's very um, it's a huge contrast between the two and that's distracting your eyes tend to be drawn to very bright or very contrasty areas of an image um, so crop that out at the bottom so it doesn't distract the viewers eye from this beautiful set of blossoms here in the middle. So yeah, my purple label is for anything that I'm going to share in my Lotus Land uh, Fine Arts social media. And then the green one is for TEAL. TEAL, T-E-A-L, is an acronym for Through the Eyes of a Lotus. That is my events and um, music event music event photography and uh, small wedding photography brand. And anything that I label green, I'll be sharing on my teal social media. So I, you know, I need to put that link in um, the info. If you look at my channel info down below the window, then there are links where you can learn about me. And I think I only put my Lotus Land Fine Art website there. I need to put a link there to Through the Eyes of a Lotus as well. 
so I'm making a mental note to do that after I'm done with this stream. Okay, so there's that flower. And you know what? To make things easy on myself, I'm going to copy, hang on, I'm going to copy the edits that I did for this photo and paste them onto this one. So I'm starting from a good, you know, a place where I know that the settings that I used before work work for me and already I like the way it's exposed I like the colors the brightness um, let me go back in now I can change the cropping to fit this image you know because the two images were composed very differently so I'll change the cropping to fit this image and what I want to show there now, I like this I would I wish that I had um, gotten this lily in more of the frame um, I do but I mean I can just for sharing online I can crop it down even further to get just get that let's do that I'm going to make a version of this. New version from current. Yeah, play that horn, T. <laughs> that sounds like it ain't necessarily so from Porgy and Beth. I um, was fortunate enough to see Porgy and Bess performed at the Metropolitan Opera House um, right before everything closed. This was in February. My birthday is in February, and it was in February. Um, they had an all-black cast, and... Well, the Angel Joy Blue sang best the night that I saw the opera. I don't do, <clears throat> I don't follow a lot of opera, but I've been following Angel Joy Blue on Instagram for probably two years now. She was featured in a Hi Ho Kids Meet video on YouTube where Hi Ho Kids Meet an opera singer. So she was the opera singer that they met and I liked her uh, spirit, the way she interacted with the kids. I liked her voice. She's a soprano. Um, and so I started following her on Instagram. Uh, I have been telling myself for a while that at some point I will have to go to the Metropolitan Opera House for an opera. I've been to only a few operas. Um, Lurks, how you doing? It's good to see you. Srisby, how are you doing? I hope you're having a good day. It's Sunday here in New York City. I don't know where you are, so I don't know what day it is there, but I hope whatever day it is, you're having a good day. So like I was saying, um, I had always wanted to go to the Metropolitan Opera House. I'm not big into opera, but I can appreciate it. And... I had seen a version of Porgy and Bess done by a touring opera company many, many years ago when I used to live in Utica, New York. So when I found out that the Metropolitan Opera would be doing Porgy and Bess for their 2019-2020 season, I said, well, this sounds like a, a perfect opportunity for me to go to the Metropolitan Opera for the very first time. I was born in New York City. I was raised right outside of New York City um, in a suburb in New Jersey, um, but I'd never been to the Metropolitan Opera. And that is one of those things that I feel like I had to do at least 
wants in my life. Can't always afford it, but you know, some things you have to save the money for and do. So um, I made up my mind that at some point I'd go to the Metropolitan Opera. I found out they were doing Porgy and Bess, and I said, this might have to be my first Metropolitan Opera experience. Then I found out that Angel Joy Blue would be singing Bess, and it no longer became a maybe. It became something I absolutely positively had to do. And I was able to go. I didn't have the money at first, but the production was so popular that they extended its run by, I think, two weeks. So I was able to catch one of the shows during the extension and got a nice front row balcony seat, you know, paid good money for a front row balcony seat and um, thoroughly enjoyed that experience. I'm so glad I got to see that. And I think it was right after Porgy and Bess finished its run that the Metropolitan Opera had to cancel the rest of the season because of um, COVID-19. So I'm glad that I went when I had the chance instead of holding out. Okay, so I made this version just so that I can crop down because I really like this lily with this flower. And one of the benefits of shooting with a full frame camera is that you can do significant cropping and still get a very nice photo without the details being pixelated. I couldn't have done this if I was shooting with any cell phone. I don't care what cell phone it is, even if it's if it even if it was an iPhone, which I'm told has uh, superior cameras. There's no way I would have been able to done would have been able to have done this with a cell phone because the sensors just aren't big enough to capture this kind of detail. So I like this. It would have been nicer if the uh, ends were in focus, but you know what? For what it is, it's a lovely photo. So I'm going to bump the exposure up a bit. You know what? That, I bet you, that's what's washing out the detail in the flower, is the exposure. Okay, I'm going to have to do this differently then. Um, what I'll probably need to do, let's fix the curves. And let's see, did I do, I didn't bump up the blacks. I bumped up the vibrance, but I do, I, I want to keep that. Don't want to change that at all. See, fill light, I think, is going to wash it out. Uh, kind of. Fill light is going to add a little bit more light to the background, which is what I want. Then I can go back here. Yeah. And uh, do an S-curve to contrast things and then let me bring this up just a little bit and that that looks a bit better I don't like playing too much with sharpening because it's easy to over sharpen things and um, that ruins I mean it doesn't it doesn't ruin the image, it makes it more pixelated. Now in this case, bumping up the sharpening actually was a good thing because more of the detail, let me put it back down to where it was. Um, if, you, if I bump it up again, you'll see, you can more clearly see the edges of these individual flowers. So bumping up the sharpening was a good thing. And if, if it looked a little bit pixelated for a minute, it's just because there's a bit of a, a lag. My computer is working very hard right now because I'm also streaming. So that is graphics intensive, it's CPU intensive. Editing photos is graphics intensive. So there will be a little bit of a delay while the graphics catch up with themselves. Um, I don't want this to be too hot. Maybe I can. Okay, that's better. The contrast is good, but just like with anything, even like with the, um, even like with the sharpening, too much is not good. You want to find that balance, you know, that that works for you. All right, so I like this one, so I'm going to keep it, and I will 
share that on my personal. Oh, let me look at the other one. Okay, so I have one that is, this is probably the one that I'm going to put on uh, social media, more so than, than this one. I like this version better. I don't know if it would look good in print just because I had to crop out so much of the image to get the subject I want. Again, I was working with a 50 millimeter lens. A uh, 50 millimeter lens, you have to zoom with your body. You can't zoom in and out. But you also have to be mindful that up to a certain um, distance, the lens will no longer be able to focus. And then I was also not wanting to fall into the bush. <laughs> while I was walking to the supermarket. So, you know, I worked with what I had and then I was able to crop the image to get the view that I wanted. Now, these are my three guys who passed me while I was photographing the flowers. And I would have loved to have gotten a shot of them where they were filling the frame more than this, but they were kind of uh, far away. By the time I looked up and realized. So I'm going to straighten this a bit because you can see the, uh, you know, the building is, it is a small tilt. It's not much, but it's enough that it bothers me. So let's see there, I overcompensated. I know what I should have zoomed in. There we go. And then I'll enable the crop so I can just crop out these the edges of the image. Well, I need to enable the crop anyway because I want to see, you know, there's, there's a lot of negative space around them. And negative space is good. It depends on the image. I like negative space because it gives a sense of place. If I zoomed all the way in where it was just them in the photo... You know, I mean, it's interesting, but, but, <laughs> but that's actually not a bad shot just because um, you can see that there is a, a very long street out there in the background uh, that they're walking towards. But if I zoom out a bit, then it gives more of a sense of environment. You know, you can see that they're in a wider area than just that one little patch of sidewalk. Zoom that in a bit so there's a little bit, little bit more sidewalk behind them. And then that really emphasizes that they are walking away from the camera. At least that's, that's what it says to me. Now, because they were so far away, um, you can see that they're... They're, they're in focus, um, but, you know, kind of, you know, a little bit pixelated around the edges. Every camera sensor has limits. I don't care what camera you're using, whether it's a cell phone, whether it's a full frame sensor camera like mine, or whether it's a super duper brand new professional, like a, um, I think the top of the line, at least the top of the line Canon used to be a 1D. Um, it, it doesn't matter. Every single camera has limits. Your job is to figure out how to work within the limits of your camera to get the images you want, but also within the limits of your software. And software has improved dramatically in recent years. You know what? Since this is people, my people photos, I like to make black and white. Um... So, like I was saying, software has improved dramatically in recent years, and you can sharpen things more, but the trick is to sharpen things in a way that it doesn't look ridiculous, or it doesn't look sharpened. So, like, okay, if I just press, I, I have this uh, extension installed in Aftershot Pro called Wavelet Sharpen. And if I just press Wavelet 1, then yeah, you can see it becomes sharper, but it looks like somebody took the sharpen slider and pinged it all the way to the far right. And that's too much. So if I put it in clarity mode, it kind of eases off on the edges a bit. 
you know I, I don't know if you can tell the difference um, in the stream but I can tell the difference looking at it on my monitor it eases the edge off just a little bit and then I can even bring the amount down a little bit with the slider and one thing that I have had to learn with Corel Aftershop Pro is sometimes the image that I see on the screen is not the um, image as I will see it when I export it. And I think that's just because um, that's just how Corel Aftershop renders its um, graphics. And so to show you, like if you look at the, it looks okay uh, when I have it zoomed out. So it looks okay. They, they look kind of fuzzy around the edges. But when I zoom in, they look a lot sharper. You know, but they don't look ridiculously sharp like it was looking before. So if let me export it real quick. And take a look at it exported. And that will really show me. What it'll look like. Yeah, it, it looks better once I export it than it looked in their window. I mean, when I export it, then um, I do add just a tiny, a touch more sharpening to it um, when I export. So that makes the edge, edges a little bit clearer. And then when I post to Instagram, the image isn't even going to be this large. So the smaller the image, you know, rule of thumb, the smaller the image, the sharper it's going to look. That's why you really do have to look at things um, full resolution on the screen to really get um, an accurate idea of how it, an image looks. So I will label that one to share on Instagram. I just have three photos left from today. And I've been streaming for an hour. When did that happen? All right. I like this one just because it's an environmental photo. And it's not what a lot of people would think about when they think about New York City, they wouldn't think about, uh, you know, a tree, you know, trees shading the sidewalk. They think about just the concrete. And that's another thing that I love to use my photography to do is to show this other side of New York City. And it's not only found in wealthy areas like Park Slope. It's found in the South Bronx, which is where I made this photo. There is beauty everywhere you go, and there's ugliness everywhere you go. It's just that um, a lot of people only focus on one or the other depending on what environment they're in. I like giving that alternative viewpoint. So I made it a little bit warmer. So you can see it's, it's, it has more yellow in it. It doesn't make the shadows look quite so cold. I turned on the sharpening, and honestly, I like this the way it is. Let me bump the vibrance up a little bit. See, if I peg the vibrance, it really, you know, the green really comes out, but I, I don't, uh, don't want to overdo it. And I'm going to use this, the other editing style that I talked about, because it's already nice and contrasty. I don't want the green yet, I want the blue. You know, muting the colors like this. Muting the colors like this is really reminiscent of um, suburban pastoral idyllic photos. And I like using this kind of edit on New York City streets to make the point that uh, sometimes it's not even the environment, it's how people choose to portray the environment. <laughs> I don't know if that, let me not apply the curve. 
Yeah, I like that. I like that. It gives that uh, idyllic type view to it. I do need to warm it up a little bit more because once I bumped up the blue in the shadows, um, then that got rid of it. There we go. That added that warmth back into the shadows. So I will, I might, uh, I'm going to post this on my Lotus Line Fine Art and make the point in my post about the idyllic nature, the editing, how you edit the photo will affect how people will view the environment that you photographed. Now, photographers and marketers and executives know this and they do it all the time. It's how they manipulate us into wanting certain things, not wanting certain things, um, liking certain environments, celebrating certain demographics, and looking down our noses at other demographics. So I like sometimes turning that on its head because I recognize those things. I actually, I started recognizing those kinds of things even when I was a kid. I didn't necessarily have the language or the knowledge to explain what I was seeing and why it upset me, but I knew that I was being manipulated and I did not like it. Now as an artist, I'm able to deliberately do that in ways that uh, marketing executives generally wouldn't for the kind of subject matter that I photograph, and I love to do that. This is one of my tree friends. I'm going to bump up the vibrance because I want that blue sky to stand out. Make sure the green leaves stand out and put a little fill light in here. So the shadows are not quite as muddy, but I don't want to wash out, I don't want to completely wash out the contrast. And maybe this one I'll put a little vignetting. Yeah, I'll put a little vignetting on that one, just to kind of darken the outside. And every time I, I um, use vignetting, then I have to bump the exposure back up because that's the nature of vignetting. Vignetting darkens the edges of the photo. So that'll be one of my personal ones. And last but not least, I'm going to do the same kind of edit that I did on this one, on this photo. But I'm going to do this one from scratch because the I wasn't shooting, I was shooting from the shadows out into the light and there is wasn't as much shadow in the foreground as there was in this one. So I'm afraid that if I just copy and paste, I won't end up with, um, yeah, I'll end up with things overcorrected and it'll be difficult for me to figure out how to get what I want. Now, first things first, I need to straighten this photo. Yeah, I, just, I love the ability to do this in software, I really do. Editing software has come so far since, um, I first started. I started, I mean, I've been shooting all of my life. I, I started when I was like seven, eight years old. My parents bought me a little point and shoot that used those cartridges. I think they're called 126 cartridges. Um, so I've been shooting since then, but I didn't start really studying photography and shooting seriously until the end, middle to end of 2007, when I finally realized that photography involves a whole technical side that I knew nothing about. So I went into, um, I started digging into it. I, I was seeing things. I'm the kind of person that reads manuals. So 2006, I bought my first um, SLR, 35 millimeter SLR. I had always wanted a camera that I could change the lenses on ever since I was a little girl. My father had a, a 35 millimeter SLR. He was not a photographer. He would make, he would use that camera to make snapshots when he would travel. He used to travel a lot for work. So he would come home with these rolls of film. He would make um, 
he'd get them developed and he would have photos of his business travels. He'd have photos of, of us when we went on vacation, you know, a whole bunch of photos of, of uh, my siblings and I when we were kids and, and our mom. Um, and so because I, of course, like a lot of kids who don't have abusive fathers, um, really looked up to my dad and, you know, cause my, my dad was my hero. He, he wasn't perfect. Um, but as a kid, I thought he was, <laughs> you know, because he never abused us. I, I was very, very fortunate and it's, and it's a shame I have to say that because it's far too common for kids to have abusive parents, but I was very blessed. My dad was not abusive and I grew up idolizing him. So since he had a camera that he could change the lenses on, I said someday I want to have a camera that I can change the lenses on. I had no idea what that meant in terms of what kind of picture you could create that way. I just knew that you could change the lenses on the camera and it looked cool and it looked super grown up and I wanted to be able to do that too. <laughs> So um, in 2006, April of 2006, I don't know why I remember that, but April of 2006, I bought my first 35 millimeter SLR. That was a um, Minolta Maxim 5. I still have it. That's my film camera. Don't use it as, as much as I would like to. As a matter of fact, I have, um, do I still have film I need to get developed for it? I might. I know that um, I want to experiment more with, I, I know I need to buy more film. I don't, I don't have any film right now. Um, but I bought my uh, Minolta Maxim 5 in April of 2006. And I was still, because I knew nothing about photography, I was still using it like the point and shoots that I had used my entire life up until then. And so I would look in the manual and I would see things about adjusting the aperture and adjusting the shutter speed. And I had no idea what any of that meant. I was shooting on auto mode. It's, it was good enough. It was all that I knew. It was good enough for, for what I wanted to do at the time. In February of 2007, for my birthday, I bought my first DSLR. It was a Canon Rebel, one of the original Canon Rebels. Um, so I bought that used on eBay. Every single one of, of my cameras, every single one of my SLRs, whether digital or film, has always been used. Um, so I bought a used Canon Rebel off of eBay and started because it was digital. I was able to shoot more because, hello, no more paying for um, film development. How wonderful. All I had to do was buy a box of a bunch of memory cards, right? Well, that's the cool thing about digital. The initial outlay of cash is a bit, but once you have the camera, you can experiment to your heart's content. You know, you have the, your camera and your software. You can experiment to your heart's content because you're not paying fees to have your photos processed. So that's what I started doing. And um, again, I was reading the manual and I was seeing phrases like aperture and depth of field, had no idea what they meant. And that's when I realized that I was missing a lot of the fun of photography by not understanding those things. So I started reading. I took a couple of courses. I don't have a photography degree. I never went to school for photography. As a matter of fact, I went to school for computer engineering. I have a master's degree, Syracuse orange men. Um, so my, my background is not in photography at all. I did not, I wasn't close to any professional photographers when I was growing up. So uh, I am very much self-taught. I've learned from other photography friends along the way um, and learned a lot by reading and experimenting and taking a few classes, one online and uh, two in person. And those classes helped me actually begin to understand the technical details of photography. So now I understand things like depth of field and I understand aperture and shutter speed. And I have used my camera so much that for the most part, if I know what I want to capture and how I want to capture it, I pretty much don't even have to think about how to set the camera. I can just do it instinctively to capture the kind of image that I want. 
Now this bumping up the green because there's so much green in the photo because of the tree in the background. You know what? I'm not sure I want to. Uh, well, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter how I edit the curves. All of this looks like one big green blur anyway, which probably means I need to desaturate my greens a bit. Let's see if that works. No, that's not going to work. Let me set that back to zero. How did I do it before? I think it was the color balance I changed. So if I add some magenta to it, eh, that's not going to separate it out. That's not going to separate it out. That's uh, Remember when I said every camera sensor has its limits, no matter what camera you're using? That's what I'm seeing here. Um, because I was shooting from a distance, um, I reached the edges of my camera sensor's ability to capture details. And it, I wasn't, I was using a 50 millimeter lens. If I was using a zoom lens, I would have been able to zoom in. And then my camera, de my camera sensor would have been able to pick up the details and separate out the leaves. But I'm not, uh, wasn't able to do that with a 50 millimeter lens from that distance. So that blob of green is going to be that blob of green. Let me see what happens if I hit the wavelet sharpen. That gives me a little bit more separation. I mean, not much, but it, it does give me some. And you know what? Since I am going to mute the colors, I might be able to get away with um, having that much. having having the edges that sharp. Let's see what happens. Let me just go ahead and do it. Like I was saying before, with digital, the, it's, the cool thing is you can experiment as much as you want. And the same is true of software. You know, in the dark room, you experiment. Those are chemicals. They make permanent changes to the photo paper. Once you've changed something, um, you have the negative, yes, but you have to actually start over with another print in digital. You don't have to do that. Once you get it into the software, all you have to do if you don't like it is uh, undo. Like for instance, I'm not liking how this looks. I'm just going to correct the, you know, correct the curves, take them back to where they were. <laughs> I love digital so much. There is there is uh, something special about digital and about film. They both have their place in photography. I'm more familiar with digital just because I have the opportunity to work in digital more than I have the opportunity to work with film because of the cost, but um, I, I love and appreciate them both. I'm not sure what to do with this one because I'm really not liking how this green is all muddied together with very little detail, but I mean there's not much... There's not much that can be done about that at this distance with that lens. This might end up being a black and white. This just might end up being a black and white. And that's the cool thing about um, black and white as well. Um, black and white takes out color as a distraction. I mean, in the black and white, I get the contrast of the, the shadows, the lines of the branches, and I, I just may end up uh, leaving it that way. This is zoomed in to 100%. Uh, Finishing up my hot chocolate. A lot of people drink coffee year-round. I drink hot chocolate year-round. And when people ask me, why are you drinking hot chocolate? It's not winter. I ask them, why are you drinking hot coffee? It's not winter. And that usually shuts them up. <laughs> it's okay if I take off the black and white. I do like the color. You know, this might be a photo that I'm going to have to come back to at some later point in time. 
Sometimes I'll come back to a photo days, weeks, months, even years later, and I'll see something in it that I didn't see before and um, be able to work with it. Or in that time, my skills have grown or the software has been updated or some combination of the two. And I'm able to do more with the photo then than I originally was when I made it. And I think this is one of those photos. I won't be able to... Uh, I don't like, I like the photo, but I don't like how it looks once I've edited it in the ways that I currently know how to edit. So I'll set that one aside for now. And that leaves me with these eight photos. These are the, the eight out of the 13 that I edited. Well, I mean, some of them are duplicates, like these two. It's a, there's a color version and there's a black and white version. And then there's the muted colors version. And I think... I'm not going to share this one. I like the muted colors version better than the regular color version. So I've got my black and white version. I'm probably going to share this one on Lotus Land Fine Art because I tend to share those more artistic photos that aren't street photography on that, um, on that Instagram. And then this one I'll share on my personal. My person. I love this edit. I really do. I may have to print this out and um, stick it up on my wall with washi tape, washi tape just to have it. And then my flowers. I, I like that I was able to get this composed in a way that I appreciate. This one as well. I like the close-up. I really like the close-up. I'm still not 100% sure of this one. Um, I think it's a cute photo, though. I think it's a cute photo and I'll most likely I'll share this one on Instagram and this is another one I'll probably go back let me keyword this um, that's why to revisit I have a to revisit keyword that I use for photos that I want to go back to and look at again speaking of keywords let me go through and keyword um, let me keyword my photos as I am going through so these four well I don't I won't do nature for all of them because the keywords that I'm going to put are all under the nature so these these two are of a tree these two of flowers I think this is a high Strange. Look. Look at my keywords. Oh, actually, you know what? Let's do. Google is our friend, right? Let, let's do a little Googling, shall we? I'm constantly telling people to. Google stuff for themselves. Let me practice what I preach, even live here on the stream. What is a hydrangea? <clears throat> I use DuckDuckGo as my search engine because it doesn't, um, it does not track you. It protects your privacy. So I like using Wikipedia as a starting off point. It looks like a hydrangea, kind of, sort of. Hydrangea macrophilia, that's definitely a, oh, that's definitely a hydrangea. Okay, so this is a hydrangea. And I will put, let me see if I already have that keyword in my library. You know, I love organizing stuff. It makes it so much easier when I'm trying to find something later nature i do not have hydrangea okay so and oh wait no i didn't blow out the i do have hydrangea okay so under flower i will add hydrangea it's definitely not a rhododendron because it doesn't have all the stamens <clears throat> okay so those are keyworded this one is keyworded to revisit, but I'm also going to keyword it street photography. And this one I will keyword, I'll keyword 
tree, but I'm also going to keyword it Bronx because it's a photo of a Bronx street. And this one I'll keyword tree. And while I'm thinking about it, let me turn off my filters, go back to the photo that I said I'll have to come back to. And I will keyword, oh wait, I, I needed that one. I'll keyword it tree, but I'll also keyword it to revisit. And um, if I scroll down here, yeah, I have five photos right now in my to revisit. Those are the, there are five different photos in my library that I want to go back to and look at and possibly re-edit. But these are the ones. Put my labels back on. These are the ones that I ended up with today. And I'm very happy with what I ended up with. I'm very happy that I took my camera with me when I went grocery shopping. I'm very happy that you sat with me and watched while I went through my photos. So I am going to end the stream here. I really appreciate you being with me while I uh, sort through and edit my photos from today. I want to do this again. I don't know when I'll be going out to shoot again, but I have an extensive photo library of tens of thousands of photos so there's always something that I can re-edit or edit for the first time and share it with you all so I hope to do that again very very soon have a great rest of your day and I will chat with you all later